Join me in prayer. Oh God, open us up today. Open our eyes that we might see your blessings in the world all around us. And open our ears that we might hear your word in the midst of these words today. Open up our hearts, God, that, that we might hear your, your uh, love for us. Experience that in a firsthand way. And then in response, God, open our hands that we might serve you and our neighbor. Amen. Amen. So when I say purple, what comes to your mind? What do you think of? So if you think of a football team, <laughs> Katie Montgomery Mears, uh, <laughs> Tigers, right? She, or maybe a TCU person, that is a sign of misplaced priorities. <laughs> if, if, so in, in between services, one of the young adults who grew up uh, at the, in that era said, I think of Barney. Ooh, Barney, the, uh, some of you remember the, the uh, purple dinosaur. I think of sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving, here's why. When I was a freshman in high school, I uh, was in a Bible study that was led by a young man, a uh, college student, um, early 20s. Uh, he, he, uh, we met in his um, apartment, I guess. It was sort of a dorm apartment in Saluki Arms. He was in a wheelchair. He was a lot of fun. He was this positive, spirited guy. And he, he used to show us how he could go down the stairs in his wheelchair and balance all the way down. And I, I was just like, wow. And he'd just laugh the whole time. And I was just so impressed by him, um, by, by how he taught us about scripture. But I don't remember much about that. I just remember him. On, on his wall in his Spartan apartment, there was like nothing on the walls. The only thing that was there was this one little wooden frame. And inside hung a purple heart. And I didn't understand what that meant. I finally asked him, what's the heart metal on your wall? And he explained that that's how he had, a piece of shrapnel had broken loose in Viet, had, he, they'd, someone else had stepped on a landmine and he had taken a piece of shrapnel in his back and that's why he was in a wheelchair. And I, I just remember being, I don't know, amazed by him and his gift gift to us. Our, our passage today is about a woman who dealt in purple. I wore a purple tie for it. it uh, here's the story. I want you to have the context of it because it's really an, a really crucial moment in the life of the early church. So if you remember from last week, Paul has been in, he had gone on his first missionary journey, had come to Jerusalem for what was called the Jerusalem Conference and then had gone back to Antioch. And it was there that the, that the church moved from being just about Jews, just about Judaism, a sect of Judaism, if you will, to including Gentiles in the church. It, it was the first incredible expansion of the church from a narrower group to a wider group. Well, Paul then goes back to Antioch and he leaves after some time, after licking his wounds for a while, he he leaves on his second missionary journey. And his intent is initially to just go to the churches that he'd already planted to encourage them and to sort of you know, give them an attaboy. And, but but he's, as he's traveled, he decides to continue to going farther west. So until this time, the church has constantly been only on the continent of Asia. And Paul gets all the way as far to the west in, in uh, Asia, in the continent, as you can get to a, a place called Troas. And while he's there, he has a vision of a man from Macedonia, and, uh, which is in Europe, is in Greece, north, north of Greece. And this man says, come over and help us. And so Paul sails across the Aegean Sea into Europe. And just he travels very quickly through Neapolis and then to Philippi. And it's in Philippi that Lydia 
is converted. And she becomes the first Christian convert in Europe, which, if you think about it, changes everything. It continues to expand as the, as the kingdom of God continues to grow and expand and take in others who were outside. So uh, they go to Philippi, and there no, there's no synagogue there. And so they go to, because uh, Paul always went to the synagogue first. Well, there was no synagogue there. So they go to a place on Sabbath. They go to a place by the river that had been reputed to be a place of prayer. And they were just going to pray. But while they were there, there were these women that were there. The women were responsible in most of most in that culture to be the ones to carry the water. They were the one literally carry the water from the river to the to the uh, to the village. They were cooking. They were uh, cleaning the clothes. And while they're there, so when he gets there on the Sabbath, he preaches. Paul preaches. And there's a and and Lydia is there, and she hears Paul and is converted. And it's, it's this amazing uh, uh, change in her life. So what I want you to think about today is what did Lydia have to offer? Her, her life is changed, and so what does she have to offer back? And maybe it'll help us think of what we have to offer. The, the first thing is that she offers her heart. She opens her heart, or God opens her heart, and she offers it. So listen, listen to the scripture. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. Here's what we know about Lydia. The scripture here tells us she was a worshiper of God. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God. Now what does that mean? She's not been converted. So a worship, there, throughout scripture there's a phrase, the worshiper of God. Sometimes it's called a God-fearer. These are Gentiles who had come to believe in the one God, Yahweh. They no longer followed the pagan gods of Rome, but had been followers of the one God, Yahweh. They'd been attracted to the Jewish community. They'd gone to the, to, to, they sort of stood around or stayed around the fringe of the Jewish community. They followed some of the practices, but not most of them. But they did believe in the one God, Yahweh. Well, here, Paul begins to tell them about Jesus, the Son of God. And all of a sudden, through that process, her heart is opened. And what I find interesting is it doesn't say um, the, the Lord opened her mind. The scripture says the Lord opened her heart. I wonder how many of us are worshipers of God. We, are, we, are, we, we come to church on Sundays. We make our offerings, we do our thing, we go through the motions, but we don't have that heart connection. There's no sense in which our hearts have been opened to Jesus and, and that that portal which, through which love flows both ways, God's love flows into us and our love back to God, that that portal's never been opened, that we don't have that sense of being in a love relationship with, with Christ. Well, that's what changed in Lydia. She was able to offer her heart. And, and if you think about it, in all of our giving, and everything we do, right when, when the offering was, plate was passed, and, and some people put a check in or some gave at home, whatever you give, whenever you give that gift, what God is most interested in is not how much that is. What God is most interested in is your heart. What does this gift say? Am I give, is that a gift out of obligation? Is it a gift out of uh, um, a desire to achieve my agenda? I'm going to support the thing I want to make happen, so I'm going to... Is it, or is it just a response to God's love for you and a way of demonstrating your love back? Right? The, the most important thing we want to give is our heart. Christina Rossetti is uh, one of the great poets of the, of the 19th century, and you know her poems, you just may not know you do. We sing one at Christmas. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would give a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. What can I give? I give him my heart. To give my love. 
That's the core of it. That's what, what really changed in, in Lydia. Well, what does that lead to then? Well, that leads to then her wanting to respond some way uh, out of that love to, to somehow make it tangible to do something. So, she, so then she offers her home. When, the, when she and her household were baptized, as an aside, by the way, um, sh- her whole household is baptized. This and the, the, the uh, verses immediately following it both are um, one of the biblical images for infant baptism. So there's not many of those, but we look and we recognize that these were, her household did, doesn't say anything about them being converted. It simply says that she basically had responsibility for them and then made that decision that they would be baptized. So it's not a believer's baptism, it's a baptism of grace, God's grace. So anyway, that's just an aside. Uh, When she and her household were baptized, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon them. So she opened her home we have a whole nother section, and then at the end of the chapter, uh, I'll talk about what happened in the meantime. After leaving the prison, they went to Lydia's home, and when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. They went back to her house. Her house is the heart of it. You know, uh, one of the things I love about studying the scripture is that I find new things out all the time, and I had never noticed this. I don't know how I missed it. In between these two, two passages, between the end of verse uh, um, 15 and the beginning of verse 40, there's a, there's a story that you may be familiar with. In Philippi, Paul and Silas are thrown in jail, and they're in chains, and they're singing hymns while they're in chains. Some of you remember this story. And uh, all of a sudden, an earthquake, the Holy Spirit comes, and an earthquake comes, and, and they're set free from their chains, and the jailer sees that. He sees their incredible spirit of, of joy and, and peace in the midst of their, their imprisonment, and he sees the power of the Holy Spirit, and the jailer is amazed. And here, here's what's so interesting. The same rhythm happens again. He hears them. He and his household are baptized, and he invites them to his home. That same exact rhythm. Look, the early church lived in homes. That's where it met. It met in homes. If, if you go to Israel today, I hope you get a chance sometime if you haven't been. Uh, Katie Montgomery Mears is taking a trip this fall. Uh, and you go, when you're in Israel, you can go to Capernaum. And in Capernaum, there is this church, kind of, that looks like a flying saucer. It looks like a flying saucer has landed there. And you're like, what is that? Well, the reason it's like that is because it's built, it's a, it's a, a, a church slash sort of museum that's built over the ruins of Peter's house. And so you can look down through the floor and see the ruins of Peter's house. Before they built it, you could see it, that the church over it, you could see it really better. But um, what they've discovered is that that, that Peter's house, uh, the, the oldest art, artifacts, are of a home, but the newer artifacts are of a church. And it, now they've built, a, a, or long ago, they built an octagonal church around it, and then they've put this other church kind of on top of it. But, but the important thing to remember is that Peter's house became a church. If you read the letters of Paul over and over again, he says, greet Prissa and Aquila and the church meeting in their house. Or uh, greet um, Nympha and the church meeting in her house. Over and over, see, the church met in homes. And it grew so fast because of that. Um, In China today, there is a whole movement called the house church movement. And in China, there is really one um, sanctioned church, one church that is allowable. And it is called the Three Self Patriotic Church. My goodness, does that sound crazy? Three self-patriotic church. Well, in addition to that, there are all of these, these little house churches that are just popping up that are not sanctioned. 
And about three years ago, they really began to try and um, do away with those and, and, and persecute the leaders there and arrested the leaders. And, but, it, but, it, but it's like whack-a-mole, you know? They keep these churches pop up and little pastors in their homes start a church and the government cracks down on them, but then another one pops up over there and over there and over there and over there. And it's just this movement of the house church because people are meeting in homes and there's something powerful about that. You see, when we meet people in that setting, I'm going to be honest, it isn't just about the place. It's, it's about this, this openness to other people, this willingness to be vulnerable that happens when you meet in homes. A funny thing happened to me a, a week ago. Uh, last Sunday, um, there's a man in our church who is um, in hospice care. And I was going to visit him at his home. I had an appointment at 4 o'clock to see him. And so my assistant had put in my calendar the address, and I hit the little button to turn on the GPS and followed it. And, and it said to go down the street and turn right. And so I went down the street and turned right, stopped at 2112, rang the doorbell. The lady answered the door. And she was a member of the church, saw her, recognized her. She looked eyes got really big when she saw me. Well, hello. And I was like, uh, you know, I have an appointment. And she's like, well, come in, come in. Our house is such a mess. Just come on in, come on in. And she's straightening stuff up. And she's like, we just got back from the beach. And that seemed odd. And uh, all of that. And then her perfectly well husband comes down the steps and I think to myself, he really looks fine to me. I, I, uh, and, and I, there's this awkward moment where I'm sort of stuttering around and she's stuttering around and she says, you're, you're, I don't think you're in the right house, are you? And I, I said, no. And I told her uh, what the address was and she said, you turned too early, you're on the wrong street. It's down there, it's 2112, another, another street. So, but what was interesting is we got in a great conversation, and I know she was thinking, pastors don't just show up at your house. What is up, what is up with that? And, you know, but what's funny is, just even in that five-minute interchange, a different kind of relationship was formed, right? Just in that, in that moment, because there's a vulnerability there, Right? Um, there's a member of our church who had, back, do you remember Hurricane Rita when everybody went, uh, the hurricane never actually hit here, it hit Sabine Pass, but, but everybody tried to leave town at the same time and the, the freeway got just um, shut down uh, uh, with a, and so anyway, this lady is trying to leave town and she's got her elderly mother in the car and I think her kids are with her, and maybe a dog. I can't remember that part of it. And, she, and they get partway out of town, and you know, it just it, they're running out of gas, and it's hot outside, and people are just out of their cars, and it's just a horrible situation. And her elderly mother is, is struggling, and she can't figure out what to do, and so she leaves, she crosses the median, and finds this little dirt road through like deliverance land, you know, and she's driving down this road and it's getting dark and, and she comes across a trailer house uh, and, you know, out in the boonies. And she stops and goes up to the door and knocks on the door and says, can we sleep at your house? Weir was, you know, tells the story and she says, I have an elderly mom and I, I you know, I, I don't know what else to do. We've got to go to the bathroom. We've got, and the lady says, well, you can, you can sleep on the porch. And so they bring, but they bring out all these sleeping bags and ways to let them sleep on the porch. And then they bring, she brings her mother out of the car up to the, the door and the people look out and see the older lady and says, I can't let her sleep outside on the porch. So they invite them in, cook them breakfast the next morning. A bond is formed with people that you don't even know when you're willing to be vulnerable enough to open yourself up to them. Now, homes make that happen. I don't know, maybe, what can you give our, our youth meet on Wednesday night in homes? Maybe most of them meet in parents' home, but maybe you can 
uncertain times they need a home, maybe you can call our youth student ministry office and say, hey, our house is available if you want to, to meet. We have uh, scripture shared coming this fall, a Bible study, and maybe you can gather five or six or eight people and from, that you, uh, from your neighborhood and say, come on to our house and we'll watch the videos and do the study together. I don't know, but there's something just about opening your home to others. All right, so she opened her home. She was vulnerable to others. Here's, here's the final thing. What we don't, what so interesting, so Lydia was a businesswoman. She was a dealer in purple cloth, which is very expensive. Pur, uh, purple cloth, the dye, purple dye came from one of two things. One is called murex, which was this uh, secretion of snails. And the other came from a root called the madder root, M-A-D-D-E-R, which is found near Thyatira, where apparently she had come from. And so she would bring textiles from Thyatira to her home in Philippi, in Philippi, and she would sell them there. And she apparently, as a businesswoman, had done quite well for herself. Here's what we don't know for sure, but most scholars believe that that Lydia became Paul's benefactor, been, been, been the one to support him. Here's what Philippians 4 says. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I let, set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. She, um, most people believe that was Lydia. That she took the resources she had, she'd done well, and she supported Paul. She gave her help. You, you know, in the church, there are all of these people who work behind the scenes, who provide the structure, the support for the ministries to go on. And nobody sees them. They're, you know, they're un, not recognized, but they, they provide funds, they provide the, the nitty gritty help work, the structure behind it. Have you ever been to the Statue of Liberty? When I was a kid, we went up in the Statue of Liberty. And, and what I remember more than anything was walking into the, you know, when you finally get inside the statue and looking around and seeing all of the, the support stresses and uh, trusses and, and uh, structures and, and struts and all of these things that held up the Statue of Liberty and me thinking to myself, gosh, who would have thought that? From the outside, you just see this beautiful statue, but inside there's this huge structure that supports it. And, and that's true in the church, right? That, that what can I give? Well, I, I may not you know, be able to preach like Paul or, or, or teach, but boy, I can, I can be underneath it trying to hold it up. I can be praying for it. I can be supporting it financially. I can be offering words of encouragement. I can do those, those things underneath that hold, that hold it up. Do you remember um, in 2010, they had the, this um, uh, ad campaign from Procter & Gamble, P&G, um, during the Olympics that was thank you mom you remember that that was so great it was like you know here's the Olympic athlete this the figure skater but here's mom who drove her to all of the lessons and paid for all of the stuff and got her where she had to go and has supported all of this underneath her but but here's the star but would never have happened without all of that structure underneath well that's true that's true for Lydia too she was that structure underneath Maybe that's something you have to give. All right. The Color Purple. It's a great book. Great movie. Won the Pulitzer Prize. The, the movie won the Academy Award. And as you're reading it, you wonder what the, purple, what the title means. Now, early on in it, there's a, a phrase in which the main character says that she always had thought about, uh, wanted a purple dress because it stood for royalty. So you think, maybe she's going to get a purple dress in the end, that, she, that things are going to turn out well for her. Well, it, she has just this hard, difficult life. 
And near the end, there's, then you finally go, oh, that's what the, the title means. Because one of the main characters says this. He says, it really makes God angry. She said, I think it really makes God angry when you walk past purple filling a field and you don't notice it. And you, you, you realize how much God has blessed you, even in the most difficult circumstances, you realize how blessed you are. To, to just open your heart to see and receive God's love so that you can offer it back in return. To wake up and, and realize just how blessed you are. That's the heart. That's the heart of giving. Let's pray. Gracious God, we know that there are people who are worshipers of God and, and, and yet are anxious to open their hearts and just connect. And we pray, God, that somehow, somehow by the power of the Holy Spirit, hearts would be opened and that relationship of love would, would become real. And out of that relationship of love, God, we pray that you would show us what we do have to give. Our vulnerability, our willingness to be open to others, our support of, of all of the great work that you are accomplishing. All for your glory. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.